what meanwhile I will try to read for you what is uh, hidden, it says scalar Young Mills equations, right? And so I'll tell you about um, these scalar Young Mills equations. So the, um, <clears throat> the uh, context is uh, we'll start with a compact complex manifold M of dimension N. And then we have a holomorphic vector bundle over M. That's the starting very simple setup. And uh, the equations here are equations, uh, what we call Kähler Young Mills equations, are equations for a Kähler metric G on M and a Hermitian metric. Where's my metric? <laughs> it has evaporated. Let's go to the dissolving limit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, oh dear. Uh, let's see. That's going to get any better. Maybe you can uh, move that. Is it possible to move? Can we go full screen? Maybe some somewhere. Don't, 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 don't move for me. Maybe. maybe, yeah. View, full screen, full screen mode, yeah. <clears throat> well, maybe the, the thing, the tab there can be moved somewhere else. Yeah, we have to get rid of this top button somehow. Right. I mean, we hadn't had this problem in the previous lectures, so I don't know why now we have it. Yeah, thank you. Very good. Here's Microsoft. Okay, <clears throat> okay good. So, uh, so these equations are equations for a Kähler metric G on M and a Hermitian metric H on E. And the first equation is a very familiar equation that we have already encountered, is the Hermitian Young Mills equation of H with respect to the Kähler metric G. Well, the second equation um, couples the scalar curvature of this metric to a term uh, uh, involving the curvature of the Hermitian metric on E which is, uh, this involves a four form. There's a, a trace, I mean, we have to wedge uh, to um, this twice with the Kähler, with the Kähler form to obtain a function right, that we couple to the scalar curvature of G. And we say this to be C. So as we have already been familiar with this, FH is the curvature of the Chern connection, right? This was the contraction of the curvature with the Kähler form. And here, as I said, is the scalar curvature of the metric G. And uh, this uh, parameters here, alpha, is a coupling constant for you appearing here. Remember lambda, we already saw this. So, so the, the dimension is, is at least two. So complex manifold of dimension equal to N. Take your favorite N. Yes, the, this, this, uh, Take your favorite N. This I, curvature, yes. this curvature uh, wedge itself. We are anticipating something that will happen in dimension one. Okay, now uh, I will I will I will comment on that. So uh, you have so this coupling constant, and then you have these parameters lambda and c that are determined by the topology. We already saw actually how the uh, the <clears throat> lambda appearing in the Hermitian Young Mills equation is determined by the by the topology, right? Uh, in, by taking the trace of the equation and integrating, you can relate uh, that to the slope of the bundle with respect to the Kähler form thing. Uh, with respect to the Kähler form, where the degree, remember, was depending on the Kähler form. And the, the C, this other uh, parameter or this uh, real number appearing in the second equation can also be uh, determined topologically by again integrating, integrating the second equation, and then you find uh, this relation here, right? This relation that connects to the degree of the tangent bundle and degrees to the second chain character of the of the vector bundle and this uh, coupling parameter. So these are the equations. These equations were introduced um, up here in ten years ago, but they were actually 
based on the thesis of uh, Mario Garcia Fernandez. And uh, so they have been around for about 15 years. <clears throat> and um, so the, uh, the equations, uh, what were this, I mean, by now uh, we have already uh, followed uh, many times the principle that symplectic geometry is what somehow dictates natural equations. And these equations are exactly appearing uh, from, that, from that perspective, right? Uh, they are very natural equations. You can write them, you can see, but where do they come from? Let me explain. So they come from, uh, as a moment map uh, uh, of some, uh, or some group acting on some infinite dimensional manifold. Let me tell you uh, how to, what is this manifold and what is the group? And again, as already in the case of just the Hermitian Young Mills or, or the vortex equations, uh, we take the perspective, a different perspective of taking a C infinity vector bundle E uh, and uh, over M, where M is actually here is just a, um, a manifold, a real manifold of, the, of even dimension. And what we do is we fix a Hermitian metric on the bundle E and we fix a symplectic form on M. So M is a symplectic manifold, right? Uh, endowed with this uh, omega. And uh, EH is a Hermitian uh, C infinity vector bundle, right? So now uh, the infinite dimensional manifold uh, uh, on which a group will act giving us the moment map equations is in fact given by the following. On the one hand, we consider uh, complex structures on the smooth manifold of even dimension M, J, right? So satisfying J squared is minus identity. We may suppose already that they are integrable, right? So uh, otherwise you would consider almost complex structures, but implicit here is there is just the integrability condition that indeed they define um, a, a complex structure on M. And then we consider on uh, the bundle uh, E, the unitary connections on the Hermitian bundle EH. So inside the product of this, we now consider a sub variety or uh, uh, let's say a sub manifold consisting, consisting of um, uh, already, you know, uh, we have fixed here complex structures. So these J's defined complex structures. And now we take pairs in which A induces a holomorphic structure on E uh, uh, over this complex manifold, right? And which by we, we, we mean that the Dolbo operator, the zero one part of this defines a holomorphic structure, right? And moreover, that in fact, uh, we could have said this uh, at the beginning, that actually the J's that we are considering here, right? We remember we fixed the symplectic form. We considered J's so that this complex manifold is actually Kähler. Okay, that's the sub variety. And there's a, a bit of an abuse saying, uh, this is a, first of all, is a C infinity manifold. It is, uh, the, you have to endow it as I already mentioned with the appropriate Banach structures and so on, but this is all formal. But, but moreover, in considering this sub variety, there may be singularities. So this discussion is uh, quite, uh, you know, basically formal, but there is a, a smooth part of it, which is actually an open uh, part of it that is uh, relevant and, and, uh, and uh, for which what I say makes exactly perfect sense uh, rigorously. So, on the space of connections uh, over a Hermitian vector bundle, there is a canonical symplectic structure that has been used, you know, the Atiyah, Bott, uh, Donaldson um, uh, symplectic structure uh, from which one obtains the Hermitian Young Mills as a moment map, I would say for what. And then similarly, there is, uh, there is also a symplectic structure on uh, the space of complex structures. Let me not write the expression, this is well-known things. And this, um, we can restrict this symplectic structure to this sub variety, to P. For a fix, actually notice that alpha now this, uh, we're putting an alpha here, which is uh, different than zero. Uh, we could put, you know, alpha one and alpha two here, but it's just one parameter here. 
and this is the symplectic form that we're going to use on P. So P and is together with omega alpha is our symplectic manifold to which we are going to apply the moment map thing. Now I have to tell you what is the group, right? And for that, just as I just mentioned, remember that in the case uh, of uh, the Hermitian vector bundle, there is the gauge group of automorphisms covering the identity, right? And this is the group that acts symplectically on the symplectic manifold of connections endowed with a natural symplectic structure. And this was a T of bot computation for human surfaces and then uh, Donaldson extended the argument clearly to, to higher dimensions that the uh, curvature uh, or rather the contraction of the curvature with the Keller form appears as moment map. And so um, being a solution to the, uh, for a connection to be a solution of the hermitian yang Mills equation is actually being a zero of the moment map, right? So that's the idea about Donaldson's story. Very familiar to, to all of us here, I think, but now perhaps less familiar uh, to some perhaps is a similar story that uh, is actually also true for the case of uh, when you have the group of the uh, of a symplectic manifold, the group of Hamiltonian symplectomorphisms of M omega, call it H. And this is a group that acts on the space J of complex structures with a natural uh, symplectic structure and acts with a moment map. And the moment map is basically the scalar, is the scalar curvature of the, of the, of the, of the complex structure. Uh, and the, and the scalar, of the scalar metric, if you want, right? And so being a zero of the moment map is really basically that this scalar curvature is constant. So this was discovered independently by Fujiki and Donaldson. And actually uh, we add here the name of Quillen because this was well known to Quillen in the case of surfaces. He never wrote it, but it was a question of Atiya to Quillen uh, who he, uh, he gave an argument. So this is, so what, we will do is a combination somehow of these two pictures. And to be more precise, let me tell you what is the group that we will consider. So uh, we will consider um, what we call the Hamiltonian extended gauge group. I mean, in physics, uh, you don't care only about, uh, say, the usual gauge group that induces the identity on the manifold, but actually, uh, generally, you care about extended, sometimes you care about the extended gauge group, uh, which covers some um, uh, automorphisms of the manifold itself. So here we consider a particular extended gauge group where the extension is by considering uh, that um, uh, automorphisms of the Hermitian vector bundle that cover a Hamiltonian symplectomorphism of the symplectic manifold, right? And this group fits into an exact sequence of uh, groups, so infinite dimensional groups, what, uh, so is this group is G tilde, and it has uh, in the goes as a subgroup, as a normal subgroup, the gauge, uh, the usual uh, uh, gauge group, uh, inducing the identity on M, and the quotient is this uh, Hamiltonian symplectomorphisms, right? So the yeah, so the thing is that this group acts actually on the subvariety P that I described previously. And the action on J is via the projection, via the projection we project to, to H. And so this acts on the space of complex structures on M just exactly as H acts. And on the other hand, the extended gauge group on connections acts as the gauge group acts on connections, whether it is extended or not. That is natural action of the gauge group. And so the, the, the calculation here is that the, uh, there is a moment map for the action of G tilde on this symplectic manifold. And uh, there is a moment map, there's an equivariant moment map. And being a zero of this moment map is exactly being a solution to the kähler yang mills equation that I wrote. So this is uh, the, how the, uh, this kähler yang mills equations appear naturally from the most natural action of the most natural group that you have in the story, right? And uh, yes, um, 
And moreover, uh, formally for alpha bigger than zero, this quotient, this, uh, this has, I mean, this uh, symplectic manifold has actually a canonical digital invariant Taylor structure and the quotient, the symplectic quotient, which is the moduli space in the problem is therefore uh, in the smooth part is, is uh, sorry, is, is indeed a Kähler manifold, right? This is a moduli space that we are naturally uh, interested in understanding. Right. So notice, let me uh, just call your attention on the fact that uh, the, um, the, the fact that this extension is non-trivial, that is not the product, accounts for the existence of the coupling term with a scalar curvature right, that appears in the second equation that I wrote. Now that's exactly that, that uh, the, um, this. So this term here appears precisely because of that, uh, because of the non-triviality of the extension of the Hamiltonian extended gauge group. That is where the, the thing appears. <coughs> Any questions here? Okay, so you see, we, we recover uh, the Hermitian Young Mills equations in this theory, while the usual uh, constant scalar curvature of the theory of Yao Tian Donaldson is deformed to incorporate this interaction term with, uh, with, uh, um, with the curvature of, of the Hermitian metric on the bundle, right? And uh, this is exactly what I said uh, before. And uh, as Nuno was uh, observing, uh, you see this uh, quadratic term, uh, this, this uh, four form that appears uh, in the case of a Riemann surface, where, I mean, when the dimension, complex dimension is one, is zero, and therefore there is no coupling. It doesn't mean that the theory is absurd. Yes, actually the theory is, uh, solved thanks to the Riemann's uniformization theorem that establishes the existence of a constant scalar curvature metric on a Riemann surface together with the Neresim and Sushadi theorem. It's quite an important theorem. So there is the solution uh, in the case of Riemann surfaces is, uh, is uh, derived from there, but from this point of view, it's not interesting. Right? There's, no, uh, there's no coupling, right? And so in complex dimension one, uh, this theory is is reduces to the well-known theories that well known. And uh, let me also point out that these equations in the same way as the Hermitian young mills appears uh, for minima of uh, young mills functional and the constant scalar curvature appears as minima of some Calabi functional. Uh, in here, there is a functional that involves uh, both ingredients and this we call Calabi young mills functional. And these do appear as minima of this Calabi Yang, Yang Mills functional. Um, so the program that we uh, initiated in uh, the thesis of Mario was really to study the existence of solutions of these uh, equations. And, uh, and also, um, um, well, first, yeah, first observation that this is a really hard problem because in general, this is a system of coupled fourth order fully nonlinear differential equations. And so it's, it's much harder than the Hermitian Young Mills and much harder than this constant scalar curvature. So, so, uh, so it's a hard problem, right? So it's, if you know, it's, I mean, if you want, it's a harder problem, certainly than Young Mills, and harder with this constant scalar curvature uh, theory, uh, the Yao Tian Donaldson, which is a very difficult theory, as we all know, right? So, uh, but. Um, we had some motivation to study this. Uh, one motivation came from uh, algebraic geometry. And as very often happens, by studying these moment map equations, you end up with natural stability conditions that allow you to define a, a, a good moduli space. And the moduli problem here is one parameterizing uh, uh, complex projective uh, varieties, uh, complex uh, manifolds, complex manifolds, and a vector bundle, the pair, 
right? So this is exactly the, 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 the moduli problem that somehow uh, uh, what, uh, the stability condition related to this problem is, would be the one coming from solving these equations. Right? And so in the paper that we, first paper that we wrote, uh, we give some existence results for a small alpha by perturbing, you know, from constant scalar curvature, a okay, matrix and Hermitian Young disconnection. So you, by perturbation, you can prove you have some results for some small values of this parameter alpha. And uh, there were later work by uh, Keller and Thomas and Friedman, uh, more interesting that they found on uh, three on three folds, um, some uh, solutions um, uh, for which, I mean, on line bundles, for which um, uh, that didn't um, admit a constant scalar curvature. So it's very interesting work. And then Mario and Jack uh, and uh, Tripler, they uh, added other, uh, other uh, existence results um, and so on. But the general theorem, the general theory is still, uh, you know, is uh, beyond uh, our reach uh, at the moment. And so the, however, like uh, in a similar uh, way as in the, <clears throat> in the Yao Tian Donaldson theory, you find obstructions for the existence of solutions. <coughs> in this situation, like in the theory of constant scalar curvature, we can um, uh, generalize the Futaki invariant and the Mabuchi K energy. <coughs> Excuse me. And we can define also, we have the notion of geodesic stability that appears in the constant scalar curvature theory. And, uh, and so <clears throat> all the ingredients are ready and ingredients that already appear in the theory <coughs> of constant scalar curvature. So the natural conjecture, of course, that one would make is the existence of solutions to the keller yang mills equations is equivalent to this geodesic stability. And uh, this geodesic stability, you have to work out what it means algebraically. So it relates to K stability or whatever, some algebraic notion that you have to find out, right? So, so as we have practiced many times in this course, we, uh, have, uh, when you are in this kind of situation with this, general equations, you apply dimensional reduction. So that is, you try to see, uh, let's try to find the most basic situation uh, where we can enjoy the existence of symmetries and see what we can find, right? And so we will do our favorite um, procedure, uh, considering the product of a compact Riemann surface <clears throat> by P1, right? And uh, this is a complex manifold of dimension two, right? But um, now the SU2 acts here. So on this manifold, there is an SU2 symmetry on, on the sphere here. And um, we um, initiated this study in, in, in this papers here, uh, building upon the um, procedure that I have explained that goes back uh, 30 years ago in the case of just the, uh, the uh, Abelian vortices, or vortices in general, related to, uh, to uh, Hermitian Young Mills connections. Um, so I will go quickly through this because you have heard it many times. And I, I, have, I have the suspicion that you will hear more about it in the talks next week. Uh, so, uh, question? No, no? No, okay. So, so uh, remember that, okay, so I'll explain. Remember, you have a compact human surface and you have a holomorphic line bundle. It's the lowest dimension you can imagine, complex dimension on a complex manifold and the lower rank that you can imagine. But now we have this section, uh, the, this uh, holomorphic section of fill, and we were able to construct this holomorphic rank two vector bundle on X cross P1, uh, uh, encoding the Higgs field in the <clears throat> extension class, remember, I. We'll go fast through this because we have already seen it several times, right? Here it is. And so there is the SU2 action, 
and uh, on x cross p1 and the su2 action acts on the vector bundle so the whole setup is actually that of an su2 equivariant holomorphic vector bundle on uh, x cross p1 and now the kind of metrics that we are going to look in the kähler young mills equations are in particular su2 invariant kähler metrics on x cross p1 and every su2 invariant kähler metric on x cross p1 has this kind of shape it's just the pullback of a metric on x and the pullback of a Fabinius studi metric uh, conveniently um, with some uh, depending on some parameter right as we have seen so these are the metrics that we are going to explore in the kähler uh, young mills equations on this manifold and similarly uh, the uh, metrics the su2 invariant metrics on this vector bundle on x cross p1 are really de determined by a metric by a metric on l so so here is the the thing the the computation the computation is that an su2 invariant solution to the kähler young mills equations on this bundle, this tension here, is equivalent to a solution of the following equations. And these are a metric on X and a Hermitian metric H on L. So, okay, I will now tell you the equations, but the fact is that now we have end up, ended up with a problem on a Riemann surface and a line bundle, right? Which is non-trivial, right? And the non-triviality comes from the fact that this was uh, too complex I mentioned. The first equation is our good friend, the vortex equation, the abelian vortex equation, while the second equation couples the scalar curvature of this metric to this term that involves the Laplacian, right? The coupling parameter alpha and this other parameter tau. Now this, both alpha and tau are real parameters in the problem. They are not fixed by the topology. So, so they, are, they are positive parameters and uh, and so these are the equations that we call gravitating vortex equations. And I guess the name gravitating uh, is quite natural considering that you are varying the metric. I think this was a, a terminology suggested by Nick and uh, we liked it um, and uh, by Nick Manton. Say that again, I don't hear you well. It is not working. Hello, yes. So uh, there, there is something else which is also called the gravitating vortex system, which is physically very natural. So you just take the usual vortex system and then add the Einstein-Hilbert action. So th you know, make the metric dynamical and add the Einstein-Hilbert action, i.e. the integral of scalar curvature. Yeah. Is, is that the same thing? Or is well, you, you'll, it you'll, precisely you'll, the same thing? The, you'll see, actually. Uh, you'll see in a moment. I think you're referring to something that will come up in a moment, right? We gave this generic name to these equations. Maybe that the term was already used, as you are saying, for uh, some other equations. And I think these other equations you are saying will appear here. It's a particular case uh, we will see huh? so the uh, so this uh, tau and alpha are real parameters so maybe we uh, appropriate ourselves of this name gravitating vortices was a very catchy name but this already uh, we were borrowing from uh, but anyway uh, so the c here is determined by the topology right and uh, and this uh, uh, see, I mean, the first equation is the abelian vortex equation, as uh, we already noticed. And okay, I wanted to make my talk self contained for someone just looking at this talk. And, uh, and we have already um, gone through this that integrating the, the equation and so on, one has this uh, condition uh, for the degree, right? V of L is more than or equal to this. And the existence theorem that we have that has been alluded many times here um, um, for the existence of solutions to the vortex equation. So this has to be satisfied, right? Obviously, otherwise. But then, so now coming back to the to the gravitating vortex equations, now we can integrate the first equation, right? 
and uh, we have this relation, right? And then we can go back uh, and so relate to the second equation. And uh, so we can um, relate the, the integral of the scalar curvature. So the integral of this is zero and the integral of the scalar curvature relate to the, to the Euler class of, of X, right? And, uh, and so then you end up with a, a, a concrete um, expression for this uh, C uh, that appears in the second equation of the gravitating vortex equations in terms of alpha, tau, and the topological invariance of X and L, right? Which is given by this. So the first thing you do when you look here is that in particular, we have that C, if C is bigger or equal than a zero, then this implies that X has to be P1, right? So it has to be uh, Martin favorites uh, Riemann surface. I will say that in this story that I'm telling, P1 is the, the, the main Riemann surface that you want. I will explain. And in fact, so let's take, uh, well, yeah, I'm matting here uh, some uh, connections to physics that uh, may connect what, what Martin was saying, but this, uh, so, um, so um, this, um, you know, let me just say the kaler yang mills equations that I introduced at the beginning, when we studied them, we thought, oh, this must have been well known to physicists because it's so natural. And we found out that they were not in the literature or something. So quite, a, uh, quite uh, surprising. However, these equations, the dimensional reduction of the kaler yang mills are in the literature, in the physics literature. And in fact, in connection to cos cosmic strings and topological defects, and in particular, when C is equal to zero, right? These equations are known uh, as the einstein bogomolny equations, and also known as soft dual Einstein-Maxwell-Higgs equations. And the solutions are actually the, the nielsen olesen cosmic uh, strings. So this is um, some, some equations that really are half fingers here by mathematical physicists. And uh, the, um, so, so these are, you know, they, they have to do something with the, you know, with, with uh, topological defects and in the early universe and so on, description of, uh, et cetera. And this alpha here uh, is, you know, somehow related to the universal gravitation constant and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this, as I already mentioned at the beginning, the vortex equations themselves are related to superconductivity. So there's such superconductivity in the presence of gravity or something. Right? I'm, I'm saying words that, you know, just, uh, just to make it sound, uh, I mean, people have been, considering these things. And so here are some, some uh, physics or mathematical physics uh, literature. I will allude to, to, to this soon. Um, okay, so, so precisely the case of C uh, equals zero. So I don't know, Martin, if this case of C equals zero is the equations that you were referring to, yeah? Yeah, so, so here is a theorem that was approved by Yi Song Yang, the same Yang that appeared uh, in Martin's lecture today. And, um, and so he, he, uh, uh, he considered the case of C equals zero, right? <clears throat> and um, uh, necessarily, as I said, the Riemann surface is the sphere, right? Uh, is P1. And he proved that if you consider an effective divisor, right? On P1 corresponding to the holomorphic line bundle L and phi, such that C is equal to zero, and the degree of L is actually the sum of the uh, of these uh, terms in the uh, in the effective divisor, right? So that's how the degree is determined. So that this is satisfied, this you have to have in order to uh, solve the usual vortex equation. Then the einstein bogomolny equations that are these uh, particular case of the, that I have been calling gravitating vortex equations, <clears throat> have a solution if ni, these numbers here, are smaller than the degree of L divided by two for all i. And also you may have a solution in which uh, is divided in two, uh, the divisor is in two points. This can only happen if n is even and the multiplicity in each point has to be uh, n over two, right? 
and with the points being different, right? So this is what he proved, right? Using the analytic tools similar to the ones that we have been seeing today. And, uh, and so actually a way of um, analyzing this problem uh, from, uh, you know, from a reasonable PDE point of view and applying the usual techniques is to fix a metric, any metric on X and any Hermitian metric on L. And then uh, the, any other metric uh, G on X is related to this by a conformal change here, right? So E to the to U, let's say, and uh, the same any Hermitian metric on L is related to a fixed metric H0 by this positive function. And now you can write the gravitating vortice equations um, for any C, and now I'm considering here not necessarily zero, can be written as this just PDEs for two functions, right? So the functions U and F, right? And these are quite difficult equations to solve, right? But this is how you, how you go. And then you observe that if C is equal to zero, right? Uh, if C is equal to zero here, then from this being zero, you deduce something about this function. You deduce that that has to be, uh, uh, U is a constant uh, time this, and then you can now plug U in the first equation, right? And so this is, I mean, this is what somehow Yang does. And this is quite similar to the Kasdan Warner equation that appears in the usual, uh, that is one way of approaching the uh, existence theorem for the usual abelian vortex equations, that was the, the, uh, the proof that Steve Bradlow gave. And you can apply usual continuity methods. And, uh, and, uh, and what Young um, did was showing that, you know, that uh, finding it suffices to assume, to find solution, this condition, right? The condition that Ni is smaller than N over two for all I, and, or you may have this kind of situation. See, so that's what he did. So, 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 in his paper, he mentions that actually this condition is a technical restriction on the local string number that is on n, right, the degree of the line bundle, and uh, he hoped maybe it can be dropped, right? That is a sort of a condition. Uh, it's not clear at this moment whether it may be uh, dropped. This is literal his his comment uh, in his paper. And, uh, and so then um, it turns out that uh, it cannot be dropped. So that this condition has a very precise algebraic geometric meaning that not, comes from the natural geometry of this problem. And this is what I want to explain. And so this is done uh, in this paper here, this analyze in this paper, <clears throat> I will mention some features about this paper in a, in a second. And so this technical restriction actually has to do with uh, the, um, uh, um, with a natural uh, meaning of the action of, um, of uh, SL2C on the moduli space of vortices, the symmetric product, which we know is actually a projective space. Right, and um, and this is a GIT condition. So SL two C acts on this uh, on the symmetric product of P one, which is projective space of dimension n. Right, and um, and this condition uh, precisely, if uh, you analyze Mumford uh, geometric invariant theory for that action of SL two C, uh, one discovers that the condition for a divisor to be GIT stable in the sense of Mumford is precisely that Ni is smaller than N over two for all I. And this other condition here is what is uh, called polystability, GIT polystable uh, for a point in this variety under the action of SL to C. So, By acting, by acting exactly, just by uh, yes, is by acting well, by acting on yes, by acting on uh, on every p one, yes, yeah, and uh, yeah, and uh, so it's inherited from the action that I mean p one. Okay, 
I should have said this. P1 is, of course, the uh, homogeneous or symmetric space SL2C mod the usual parabolic, right? And also SL2C acts on P1, right? And, um, and the moduli space of vortices, the symmetric product one, inherits that SL2C action, okay? <clears throat> and so then uh, you are in the, as I say, in the natural problem that you have in geometric invariant theory, you have a group, a reductive group acting on a projective variety. And this is, <clears throat> you analyze what is the meaning of being stable and polystable and you uh, see these conditions emerged. So, <clears throat> Now, the theorem is, okay, if there exists a solution to the gravitating vortex equations on, uh, on this, then what actually, uh, then the divisor uh, defined by LP is GAT polystable. Polystable means it could be uh, stable or strictly polystable. <clears throat> so now I have to say something about this theorem. Uh, just, um, I'm very happy about this theorem and a few months ago, we discovered a gap in our proof of the theorem. And um, um, we had no doubts that the theorem was true. And as a matter of fact, uh, in the last, uh, recent, I mean, recently, we have, um, uh, with the uh, collaboration of uh, Shengjiang Yao, uh, we have produced a proof of uh, a, a repair of that, right? And so this will appear soon. It's like you take this result that was just two pages and has blown up into a paper of 24 pages at the moment, right? So it was more involved than we thought. And uh, so, <coughs> so now, so, so let me then say that indeed, <coughs> um, this is, as I said, C being zero forces the Riemann surface to be P1. And P1 is indeed the, inter the interesting situation here. Because if you uh, think from the perspective of constant scalar curvature in the theory of, uh, of uh, Yao Tian Donaldson, uh, Fano manifolds are the interesting ones, right? And so this is a Fano situation. And, uh, and in fact, let me just say that um, you can envisage a generalization of this kind of results by considering the, um, you know, remember that the um, dimensional reduction works not just for the abelian model, but for non-abelian situations. And, uh, and you end up also in that uh, case with some gravitating vortex equations in higher rank. And there, the moduli space, as we have seen in previous lectures, is more complicated, but there are some <clears throat> moduli spaces and you still have an action of SL2C. And the action of SL2C is uh, not so obvious there, but it is just because it's acting on the base, right? Of the, uh, it acts actually on the whole moduli space by pullback and so on. So it's an interesting problem that um, we are investigating with Jesus, how to generalize this in the, in the, in the non-abelian situations, more difficult. Because there we don't even have we don't even have a theorem the, the starting theorem of Young. Right? We have to work the whole correspondence. But I just want to make uh, the point that that is the interesting situation. P one, right? A billion as uh, you have in this theorem, and the non-abelian. There are many things to explore and so on. So in particular, this procedure uh, and that was the 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 intention gives you solutions to the Kähler Young Mills equations, right? Uh, that are Symmetric under this action, huh? so that's a way you ask, that's the motivation of, of. I mean, the equations themselves may be very interesting, connect with other equations that have been studied. But the main purpose was to show that there are solutions to the Kelly Young Mills, and that was accomplished. However, having said that, the situation is interesting, uh, fundamentally interesting in uh, genus zero. There are things we can do actually for higher genus, and for higher genus, this GIT. Uh, Okay, let, let, me, let me come back to this um, and just say that uh, <clears throat> the correspondence that we are hoping for the Kelly-Jangmills equations is something like 
the existence of solutions is equivalent to some kind of KS stability. And what I'm saying is that in this kind of toy model, this KS stability thing happens to be the combination of two things. The usual uh, condition to solve the abelian vortex equations plus some, uh, as you people say, vanilla GIT stability condition, right? So that is um, very simple, right? Um, okay, finally, let's get to the case of genus bigger uh, <clears throat> than one. And here, the theorem, uh, the, the, the theory has a different flavor, which is that you can actually solve the equations, right? And um, there, is a, um, there is this coupling, and at least you, for a certain range of the coupling, you have to impose um, to have some, some bounds of this coupling, and there you can solve the equations. And the theorem here, let me see if I am saying, uh, yeah. So, the proof involves, you know, continuity methods and, and so on. And this kind of bound is needed to have some a priori estimates. So you can solve the equations with no GAT condition or anything, right? Um, and, but only in, in the range of the parameter alpha. Um, so that <clears throat> theorem <clears throat> can be regarded, it's also interesting, can be regarded as some kind of uniformization theorem for pairs consisting of a Riemann surface and a divisor, right? I mean, the usual, you know, riemann poincare uniformization theorem about existence of constant metrics, a constant scalar curvature metric uh, uh, on uh, hyperbolic surfaces and so on. Now here you have a surface and a divisor. And this is telling you that in that situation, there is a canonical, there, is a, there are canonical metrics on the surface and on the uh, line bundle. So, the device would determine some kind of canonical metric, right? Now, let me just um, finish saying that um, the, in the case where the genus is zero, the very interesting case, you can also have uh, uh, that the uh, C could be different than zero. And that was not the situation studied by Young, but, that, but uh, Mario Sergio Fernandez uh, Van Sipingali and uh, Xinjiang Yao um, actually gave a full proof of the existence of solutions um, in that uh, situation when C is non zero, right? And so that, in a sense, solves uh, completely the existence problem for these uh, billion gravitating vortices, right? And I think that uh, you will hear more about this on on this subject, I think there are at least three talks on the topic. Uh, yes, actually, uh, Tuesday, there are two talks, which are more related to your lecture. And there's going to be a related, but not as related talk on Friday. Excellent. Thank you. But let's thank. Uh, any, any questions or comments? So what do you mean by geodesic stability? Ah, yeah, that is a bit involved, um, involved uh, question. Um, you see the, okay, uh, let me put this in uh, some perspective. In the usual young mill theory, right? Uh, the key somehow for uh, the, uh, the proof of the existence theorem of Donaldson, and Ullenberg, Yao is based on a very fundamental fact that the quotient of the complex gauge group by the unitary gauge group is a symmetric space, is an infinite dimensional symmetric space. If you want, the, you take a complex uh, uh, a unitary group, UN, and the complexification, GLNC, the quotient of GLNC by UN is a symmetric space. And this is sections of that kind of uh, metrics are actually sections of that kind of uh, the space of metrics is sections of that kind of bundle. Right? Now, in the case of the scalar curvature, you know, for, for a long time, there was a, a big problem about understanding this, you know, symplectic quotient versus complex quotient, because um, there is no complexification of the group of Hamiltonian symplectomorphisms. However, 
in the problem, there is a symmetric space, infinite dimensional symmetric space. And so geodesic stability refers to studying geodesics in, in that space of metrics, in that symmetric space. So that symmetric space appears here is a combination of the usual symmetric space that you have in the, in the young mills and the other one is, is, is some kind of fibered version of that. And you have to study geodesics uh, there. And this is actually one of the main technical problems that uh, to determine what is, you know, you have to solve some equations for geodesics. And there is what we actually make a mistake in our paper, right? that we uh, took some, some uh, things that we thought were geodesics and were not. And, uh, but, uh, but even in this uh, toy problem, right, is extremely complicated, right? Uh, but that is it's a bit, I, I can address you to some papers, but that is some kind of analytic condition that you can write in general, but then you need to understand what it is. And in this uh, toy model that I was describing, turned out to be just Mumford GAT for the action of SL2C on projective space. In general, it would be something complicated, at least as complicated as the K stability that you see in the theory of uh, Taylor Einstein Mumford. Any more questions? <clears throat> So you said that uh, Kehler Young solutions of Kehler Young Mills equations correspond to minima of Calabi Young Mills function. Correct. But uh, but minima of Calabi only Calabi functionals correspond to extremal metric. That's right. Yeah, there are different kind of Calabi functionals that you can write, right? And uh, the different Calabi functionals that you can write, in fact, correspond to uh, the different. Uh, uh, solutions uh, or variational or minima are different kind of streamal metrics, in particular the constant scale or curvature metrics. Okay, in, in this situation, you can do similar thing. You can write uh, different uh, variants of the Cala of Calavi Young Mills, right? That will give you not. <clears throat> you may consider uh, other uh, functionals whose equation in the, will not involve the scalar curvature, something else. You see in the part, in the second equation of the Kelly Young Mills. Uh, those, uh, we don't know how they appear as moment map, but it, you know, this is, I don't hear you. Yes, I'm not, it's not, it's not clear to me. Uh, we thought about that. And uh, I don't remember what is the answer. Uh, probably, uh, yeah. I mean, certainly not for this action. You know, for the action of this extending Hamiltonian grip, boom, is the scalar curvature. What do I do? Right. So actually, uh, because Oscar uh, started five minutes late, uh, well, we still we might have time for more questions. Any more questions, Martin? So just a very simple one. A in your earlier on when you were setting this problem, you had a, a an integral constraint you got by integrating one of your yes, let me just try to um you refer one, to the one, volume, one, of the, one of the gravitating vortex equations. Yeah, back back further, I think. Yeah. Maybe that one. Yeah, no. I think that was uh, no. yes, like here. No, no, further on. You mean before or after? After. Oh, after. So the run is after. Okay. Where, where, where was it? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, exactly. Oh, so okay. you, you have. A, <laughs> I don't need two magnets. Uh, you, you have a condition which refers to the volume of your domain, uh, but aren't you varying the metric? So I, I don't really understand. In theorem, yi song yap. Yes. Yes. In this theorem, what is the problem? I don't, I don't understand um, the condition on the degree. This one? Yeah. Ah, well, first of all, the degree of L is naturally is determined by the effective device. Yeah, right? yeah, sure. Is the sum of multiplicity. That's one thing. Yeah. Yeah. And the other is just the, uh, oh, am I? No, no. Yeah, this is the, the usual, the usual 
bound condition that you have for the existence of the Abelian but vertices. You, right? you, do, you, which, don't, you don't know what G is, do you? I mean, G is something you're solving for, isn't it? Isn't that part of the solution? Ah, yes. Uh, yes, you are absolutely right. Actually, the um, solution for that, uh, you are completely right, is that you may normalize all your metrics to have volume two pi, right? For example, you can do that, right? You can work on the space of metrics with a normalized volume. And then uh, if I did that, you wouldn't have objective because you wouldn't have seen this in here. And I would have got the bound on the degree in the way that I like to see it, which is just less than tau, right? I mean, okay. I mean, you can normalize, you know, you are solving for the metric, right? But you can actually normalize in your space of metrics. You can, you can, well, yes, yeah. yes, you can, you can, I mean, the space of metrics here are determined by functions here. You can, you can, you can determine, <laughs> you have some censorship. <laughs> In the usual vortex, yeah. In the usual vortex equations, if you change, if you inflate your surface, I mean, it actually changes the solution. Right? It, it, that's not a. You have to simultaneously scale tau. Oh, maybe that's maybe no, no, that's the no, point. Exactly. Maybe, exactly. That's maybe the, the point. product is the thing which doesn't. That's the point. Matter. Exactly. Right. You can, you know, in the uh, usual uh, vortex equations, abelian vortex equations, you can start by fixing the volume, right? And I mean, yeah, but then you're not, then you're not varying you can, over the metric. You there. make the, uh, you know, you control by uh, taking tau sufficiently big. That's exactly what you do. I mean, uh, the important thing is this quotient between tau and the volume. This thing, uh, the product. And a possibly related question is, is alpha somehow determined here? So alpha, I'm thinking of as being Newton's constant. There's alpha is what? Alpha is Newton's constant, right? It's, it's, it's measuring how strong gravity is. That's right. Uh, is, it, is, it, is it free in this theorem or is it somehow fixed by the solution? Uh, good point. Let me see. Uh, so, yeah, let me, let me come back to this. That's a good point. Um, because I took, I took C to be zero. Right, and so yes, yes. You see, I took C to be zero, so alpha is definitely determined by tau. Yeah, you see, and yeah, the, and the other character. Because your physical intuition would be, if alpha is zero, you just have vortices with no gravity, right? And then if alpha is small, the solution should still look like a normal vortex on a plane. And then as you increase alpha, you get to a critical, a critical yeah. strength of gravity yeah. where the plane closes in on itself and makes itself into a two sphere. But here, I guess this is telling you what the critical strength of gravity has to be for that to happen. Yes, I, I know about yeah that interpretation, but in uh, just uh, uh, from the fixing this to be zero, you you see that this alpha, yeah. uh, there's no freedom for this alpha, right? Thank you. It's determined by tau. Yeah. So yeah, actually we still have. The time for a small question. I mean, a short, anyone? Okay, so maybe I'll ask. So, is there any anything you can already say about the this non abelian situation for g equals zero, or is well, it too early to ask? Well, okay, it's uh, well you can ask, and uh, there is uh, some exploration that uh, we have done. Is <clears throat> you know. Um, there has been a lot of work, as I already mentioned in some of my talks, about the understanding of the moduli spaces of non abelian vortices for genus bigger than one. And the main motivation came from Higgs bundle theory to determine the topology. This is completely different, right? This goes into the, uh, you know, genus equal to zero has nothing to say there, right? I mean, because uh, the, the, the motivation in turn from the other was in the study of character varieties of the fundamental group, right? For different Lie groups. And uh, here the flavor is quite different and we are confronted to the fact that we know very little about the moduli space of vortices on P1. Right? So one of the things I put Jesus to work was to give concrete descriptions of the moduli space of vortices 
on P1 for certain ranks, right? And these are very um, explicit kind of manifolds, right? Um, at least you know something for, you know, there is a parameter, at least you know something in some range of the parameter, right? Now, um, so once you know what is the specific, the concrete manifold, you want to explore what is Manford GAT stability for the action of F to C. Right? But now we are perhaps um, here being too, we want to be too concrete because uh, we may be able to prove the theorem by just knowing there is an action of F to C on the modulus space and just directly prove that the uh, geometric invariant theory of stability condition will uh, prove existence. But the other part, which we haven't progressed, is that now we have to set up the right functional, right? Mm -hmm. The Donaldson functional, the study to do the analysis that, uh, you know, we don't have a Young's theorem here or anything that is done just for, a, you know, for a function, something, some PDEs for a function. Here, the things are more complicated, right? Because we have, you know, is, is, is a metric on a vector bundle. Yeah. And the metric on a vector bundle is precisely the symmetric space in bulk here. Uh, let's say is uh, GL2 mod uh, U2, right? And so this is a more complicated uh, space uh, where we want to solve our equations. So we still have um, uh, far from, from really cracking this problem, I'm afraid. Okay. So now, um, yeah, so Oscar has entertained us for one full hour already. <laughs> and we, we certainly should thank him for that. Thank you.